Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to be able to start off this Down Syndrome Research Roundup um, uh, to highlight research that's going on here at the Waisman Center. And then we're going to have four presentations, uh, four different researchers studying very different aspects of uh, Down Syndrome. Um, uh, and I'm going to start off. My name is Anita Bhattacharya. I'm a developmental neurobiologist, a basic researcher uh, in the Department of Cell and Regenerative Biology. And I have been, my lab is located at the Waisman Center and I've been here probably 20 years now. So uh, I have uh, a very uh, deep and positive experience with the Waisman Center. So today I'm gonna tell you about how we can use stem cells to study uh, brain development and brain function uh, in Down syndrome. And so this starts with, um, I need to get, tell you a little bit about these really unique kinds of cells called induced pluripotent stem cells or stem cells. And so um, unlike human embryonic stem cells, these cells can be um, obtained from uh, or, re or generated from skin or blood cells from any individual. And so we can take these, uh, sorry, let me get my pointer out. Uh, we can take skin or blood cells from an individual and we can reprogram them in the lab to turn them into what we call induced pluripotent stem cells, or as I'm gonna to refer to them, iPS cells. And these are really unique cells in that they can be turned into any cell type in the body uh, in the lab, in the culture dish. And so uh, if we're interested in brain development, we can take these iPS cells and turn them into uh, uh, cells of the brain, so specifically neurons. And then uh, what we would like to do is be able to take those neurons in this case and look at how they function in the dish uh, and, and find uh, differences that may help us understand what is going on in the brain of these specific individuals. We can then use those cells in the dish um, to, uh, for drug screening and hopefully identify new treatments uh, as needed. And so, as I said, they can, these cells can be reprogrammed from an individual skin or blood samples. These stem cells can be grown in the lab indefinitely, so we can continue to use those cells without having to go back to the individual. And as I said, they can be turned into any cell type of the body. So we have been doing this at the Waisman Center and other people across the world have been doing this um, by obtaining skin or blood samples from individuals with, with Down syndrome. And what is really remarkable and really uh, helpful for us is when we take these, um, in, these skin or blood samples and reprogram them to iPS cells, they retain the extra chromosome, that trisomy 21 uh, mutation. And so all of the cells have trisomy 21. And we can use those then again to turn them into neurons in our case, uh, to be able to study trisomy 21 neurons that are, uh, again, hopefully will show uh, characteristics that we can, um, that can help us understand uh, what is going on in, in, in the brains of individuals with Down syndrome. So we can ask what's different. And if we find some targets, we can see if we can improve the function of the neurons, if that's what we find. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you about two things we're doing with these cells. The first is that uh, we know that individuals with Down syndrome have fewer neurons in certain parts of the brain. And this is taken from a Lancet article several years ago. We also know that uh, brain development occurs primarily before birth. The formation of the brain happens during gestation. And these uh, stem cells are actually, because they're such undifferentiated, premature, very, very young cells, we can use these to study some aspects of early brain development that we can't um, an analyze in uh, other ways. Uh, we can then uh, take those iPS cells, both control and trisomy 21, and differentiate them into neurons shown here in green. And we can um, assess the function of those neurons by in, in the lab uh, by stimulating uh, the neurons and recording from them. And when we do that, uh, because neurons are electrically active and that electrical activity is, uh, is critical for their function and how they communicate with other neurons in the brain, uh, we get a, a readout that looks like this, so electrical activity. And many years ago, we started these studies with our trisomy 21 neurons, and we found that we were able to see that the trisomy 21 neurons, uh, labeled here with DS, uh, have electrical activity, just like control cells. Uh, and what we found was the electrical activity is uh, slightly different. It's, it's a little bit less, it's a little quieter. And so we are now looking um, 
to, uh, un to see if we can identify what specifically is, is different about these trisomy 21 neurons and is there a way we can uh, really uh, push them to their full capacity and improve their function. And so um, I'll end there. Uh, what we would like to do, as I said, is really understand what is different about these trisomy 21 neurons and how they develop, how, how fewer are made in, in Down syndrome. Um, and uh, my research is really focused on this uh, part right here, which is the more basic research. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions in chat and then I will turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and start then. Share. Okay, I hope everyone can see my slides. Yep, looks good, Brad. Okay, thanks, Clark. So I just want to start off by thanking everyone for joining <clears throat> us today. Uh, this is just a wonderful opportunity to get together remotely. I'm very sad we can't all be together in the Wiseman Auditorium and seeing each other in person. But as, as Dr. Stanley said, there is light at the end of the tunnel, so hopefully soon. What I want to talk about just briefly today is our study, our ABCDS study, Alzheimer's Biomarker Consortium Down Syndrome. So I've, I've given the talk at the, the Down Syndrome Day with the experts for the last several meetings, and I'll just recap briefly why there is a enhanced risk for Alzheimer's disease in Down syndrome. So trisomy 21, well on chromosome 21 is the gene that produces one of the proteins that's implicated in Alzheimer's disease. So this, this particular protein can become misfolded, accumulate and form plaques over a fairly extended period of time in the brain. And that's illustrated in the, the PET image I show on the bottom, you can see the buildup over time. And as um, Dr. Arndt pointed out, there is a higher prevalence of this in Down syndrome, and we've observed that. So in the general population, uh, Alzheimer's disease is very rare before 50 years. In mid 80s, we have about a third of the population having Alzheimer's disease. However, in Down syndrome now, in the 40s, and that, that includes mid to the late 40s, around 9%, and then into the the 60 year olds, we're seeing half of people with Down syndrome afflicted with Alzheimer's disease. So the prevalence is higher and it's shifted about 20 to 30 years earlier. <clears throat> so the goal of our study, and this has been ongoing for over a decade now, and started off with a what we call a natural history study. That is just observing the changes in the brain related to uh, Alzheimer's disease. And with that study, we brought in our participants, all age 30 or older, and had them perform some cognitive, um, cognitive tests to look at their attention, their planning, their execution function, and then followed that up in the brain imaging lab by performing some brain scans on them and looking at some of the changes that can happen in brain structure and function and try to track that over time to develop some type of information regarding the trajectory. Well, in 2015, the National Institutes of Health is very excited about this work and we expanded it. And we started our NIAD study, Neurodegeneration and Aging Down Syndrome. And in this new study, we added more biomarkers and we added more sites to increase the number of people that we could include in the study. So as we've known now through all of the COVID trials going on, we need larger numbers. The more numbers lets you determine the information, lets you assess things more quickly. And that was the benefit of our NIAID study, which was coming near the end in 2020, just when the pandemic hit. So we had to put a halt to all things. So we weren't able to complete the end of that, but it gave us time to plan ahead. And now NIAID has been extended to the Alzheimer's Biomarker Consortium, the ABCDS study. We're very excited about that. Uh, 
NIH has been very supportive. Here you can see the, the posting of it on their website. And now our goal is increased to 600 people with Down syndrome, adults to track, again, these biomarkers related to um, Alzheimer's disease. And you can see all of the sites, nine there that are now included. So I want to point out, this has been an observational study, just looking at things. However, our ultimate goal is to use that information and transform it into a clinical trial. And that is what we're preparing for here in the very near future. That is capturing the trajectory of the change in amyloid in the brain, as well as some of the other uh, pathological features of Alzheimer's disease, deciding what, as far as pharma, pharmacological type of intervention or, or treatment, behavioral treatment could be implemented and what is the best time. And that is where we're going to be taking um, this next. So we're, again, we're very excited about the study ahead. Both um, Drs. Hartley and Dr. Stanley are involved with this um, study as well as a number of other Wiseman Center investigators. So with that, I want to thank all of our NIAD families and just say, um, we, we miss you. We're looking forward to having you back here and seeing you again in the very near future. We hope that you are wearing now, watching this, wearing some of your NIAD gear and just want to let you know that in the future, we're going to be transitioning largely the same study, but it's going to be ABCDS. So thank you very much for, for your attention. All right, good morning. Um, so I'm Segan Hartley and I'm a Wasteland Center investigator as well as an associate professor in the 100 Women Chair of Human Ecology in the School of Human Ecology here at UW-Madison. And I'm gonna share some findings from a study on lifestyle risk and resiliency factors for aging and Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome. And this study is an extension of work that you just heard Dr. Christian describe in the big ABCDS study. Um, and in addition to Dr. Christian, Dr. Stanley, and Dr. Oziomo Okonko and David Plant are also collaborators on the study here at UW-Madison. So as you guys got to hear earlier this morning, um, uh, tri trisomy 21 puts adults with Down syndrome at risk for accelerated aging as well as age-related health problems. So um, what I mean by accelerated aging is that we do see that physical and functional changes associated with aging occur at earlier ages and Down syndrome relative to the general population. So examples of this include an earlier age of skin wrinkling, um, vision problems such as cataracts, early menopause, and women with Down syndrome. And we also see an earlier um, and higher level of physical problems associated with aging. Um, you just got to hear about the early age of onset and increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. Um, but we also see an increased risk for hypothyroidism, um, declines in bone mineral density, such as um, that lead to problems such as osteoporosis and, and bone fractures. And we see high rates of sleep apnea, um, particularly in older adults that um, again, range anywhere from 50 to 90% of samples studied. Now, when we think about healthy aging in the general population, interventions aimed at increasing physical activity are often a really key part of these broad scale efforts we have to make us all healthier. Um, However, given trisomy 21 and some of the underlying neurobiological differences we see in individuals with Down syndrome, we really don't have a lot of data yet to know if efforts to increase physical activity should be prioritized as being a, an important prevention strategy and way to prov promote su successful aging. And if so, what exactly should we be targeting when we think about physical activity in everyday life? Now we think this is a really important area to focus on because modifying lifestyles, such as by trying to increase physical activity, really could be a low cost and low risk um, effort to promote successful aging that we could actually roll out to a large portion of adults with Down syndrome and don't have to worry about some of the issues we may get with medications. 
Um, we also think this is particularly important because we do know from data that has been published that adults with Down syndrome on average may be at risk for engaging in lower levels of physical activity. So this brings us to our study. So our study is a lifestyle study in which we're tracking physical activity in everyday lives of adults with Down syndrome who are part of ABCDS. And specifically, we ask caregivers in the adult with Down syndrome to complete a daily diary record and for the adult with Down syndrome to wear an accelerometer, just a little sort of uh, looks like a big wrist watch, so we can track their movement across seven days in their everyday life. And today I'm going to share findings from 68 adults with Down syndrome who've completed our study. And we now have funding to actually enroll a total of 140 adults in this study, and we'll be tracking them across three time points um, over the next five years. So here on this slide, you can see some data from Tori Fleming, who is a graduate student of mine here at UW. And uh, Tori found important associations between physical activity and cognitive functioning. So what you can see on the left here is that Tori found that the percent of time that adults with Down syndrome spent in sedentary behavior, meaning sort of sitting around, not moving very much at all, um, and the amount they, they spent in moderate to vigorous activity, you can think about this as getting to that level where they were jogging or sort of uh, uh, um, swimming, um, was related to their executive functioning, so their ability to hold information and use it in, in new ways, it was related to their memory, to their visual spatial ability, the ability to sort of see things in space, um, their motor control, so their ability to hold pegs and put them into a board. It is also related to early symptoms of dementia um, on average. Now, what you can see on the top figure on the right is that as the visual spatial ability um, is higher compared to lower, those adults with Down syndrome were engaged in more moderate to vigorous activity um, on, in, on an average day across those seven days. And what you can see at that bottom figure is that mental status was lower or worse for adults with Down syndrome who engaged in more versus less sedentary behavior. Again, that just means sitting around and not moving very much at all. Now, um, what you can see on the left here, this is the percent of participants who had health conditions. So this um, actually is a nice follow-up to the information you got to hear um, previously about the medical recommendations. Um, so our, um, this, our sample of 68 adults, you know, um, similar to, to what we see in other studies, is at high risk for some of these health conditions. So 60% um, did have an elevated BMI in that obese range. 67% um, had at least one endocrine condition. 25% had a muscular skeletal condition and 60% had sleep apnea um, and 65% had at least one cardiovascular condition. And what you can see on the right is that physical activity was associated with the presence of uh, many of these health conditions. So adults with Down syndrome who engaged in more versus less sedentary behavior um, were more likely to have sleep apnea um, as well as mental health conditions and those who engaged in less versus more uh, moderate to vigorous activity were more likely to have uh, sleep apnea, endocrine conditions, and mental health conditions. So what is sort of the take home message of our work? Um, you know, if we um, we're, we're trying to track this over time. So, you know, right now we're looking at associations at one time point, but we really wanna understand if physical activity can actually sort of predict um, better aging outcomes? And if so, then what this means for us in terms of developing interventions. Um, so the big, one of the big take home messages that our research is showing is that we may have to target both not sitting too much in your day, but also not getting enough moderate to vigorous activity. Um, so these actually show they're, they're independently predicting some of our health outcomes. And um, if this is borne out longitudinally, we think this has a lot of important implications for social policy, policies and disability services. So I just wanna thank the adults with, with Down syndrome and their families who participate in ABCDS as well as this lifestyle um, complement study. They are just a wonderful group to work with. We learn so much from them every day. Um, and of course, um, this research, we do it with a lot of big investigator team here at UW-Madison, but also elsewhere. Um, and we also get the benefit of a lot of funding, both from UW-Madison Wharf, the Wasteman Center, and NIH. So I will stop here, and I'm happy to answer questions as the next presenter gets ready.
Hi, so should I go ahead and start to share my screen so you, get... yep, you can start, Ruth. Okay, great. Can you see this okay? Yes, we can. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here with you today at my very first uh, day with experts. Uh, on Down syndrome. And um, my name is Ruth Lutovsky. I am a professor in the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders, and also with a joint appointment at the hospital in surgery. And my research focuses primarily on hearing, how it is that we hear in complex auditory environments and what happens with populations of people with hearing disorders. But we've had the opportunity to pivot to uh, starting to study hearing in young adults with Down syndrome. And this work is conducted in collaboration with Segan Hartley's group and with uh, the two main folks in my lab who contributed to this work are Shelley Godar and also Kayla Christensen, who you heard speak a little bit earlier today. So we focus actually on a very important question, which is why it is that we have sound in both ears and whether that matters. And it turns out that it's very important to be able to hear out of both ears in order to be able to know where sounds are coming from, such as, can you hear where the bus is coming from or where someone is talking to you in a room? It also is really important for being able to separate speech from background noise. Like, well, we haven't been to parties lately, but it, uh, in the field, we talk a lot about sort of the cocktail party effect and can we ignore one sound and listen to other sounds, but this is also very important in classroom environments where uh, children spend a lot of their time learning. And also it turns out that having access to sound in both ears makes us less tired and there's a reduction in cognitive load, which in typically developing children and adults, we've started to examine by measuring the size of the pupil when information becomes more and more uh, complicated and challenging. Um, and we've done a lot of research with children who are deaf and receive cochlear implants and adults as well, and, and have really learned a lot from that, which we've started to apply to understanding uh, what might be happening in people with Down syndrome. And, I was very motivated to move into this space when I started to read the literature and talk to Maria Stanley and other experts and understand that there's a very high proportion of hearing loss. It could be either conductive or sensory neural or mixed, but we don't know exactly how severe it is. And there's a really deep um, need to understand hearing loss in people with Down syndrome. We need to be able to have a very um, explicit and consistent diagnosis nationally and internationally it, so that we can uh, provide treatment early on and follow the treatment uh, throughout the course of a lifetime and hopefully improve outcomes in measures that we know are very important that have to do with everyday communication, such as language and cognition. And, from everything that I'm reading and hearing, and uh, of course today as well, there's been a lot of progress in treating medical conditions, but hearing status and the degree and type of hearing loss are very poorly understood. And in the field of auditory science, we think a lot about auditory plasticity and the fact that the brain needs to receive information such as through hearing aids, because there's this, uh, there's this concept that if we don't use the information that we receive, we, we're going to lose the brain's ability to process the information. And if we don't treat hearing loss, the brain might lose pathways that are important for this ability. So I'm very motivated by the need to assess hearing early, to treat hearing early and stay on top of changes throughout the lifetime. So we had an opportunity through a, a funding mechanism through the NIDCD, which is the National Institute for Deafness and Communicative Disorders, um, to study a group of young adults with Down syndrome between the ages of 18 to 24. And we were very uh, pleased to see that when we uh, presented them with a pretty complicated task of telling us where sounds were coming from. So here you see an example of what an excellent performer would look like which is that where they told us the sound came from 
compared to where the sound came from falls along the diagonal if you're very good, which means your errors are very low. So what we discovered, the blue lines here on the right show the amount of error in localizing in these adults with Down syndrome. And we found that the errors were quite low unless you had hearing loss. So on the left in, um, in orange, we see the severity of hearing loss. So the people with more, sorry, with more severe hearing loss turned out to have greater errors. And that really led me to think through the fact that we absolutely need to um, diagnose and treat hearing loss. Another task that we in, involved our participants with is a task that young children um, do quite well by the age of about four or five years of age or if they're typically developing. And this is where we present pictures and ask our participants to identify which word they hear. And then we change the level of the sound. And then we also do this in the presence of competing noise. So um, consider the possibility that your list, you have a, your participant in a soundproof room and the sound is coming from in front, either in quiet, or we also add maskers, which are other people talking at the same time. And this would be a masker in front and this would be a masker on the side. And if the masker is on the side and people perform better than when the masker is here, then that shows that they're able to benefit from localization. And it turns out that our participants did quite well with that, but we're interested in the fact that their ability to simply hear speech and identify the words um, actually was somewhat immature. So these are speech reception thresholds and low numbers is good performance. And what we discovered in our adults is that their thresholds were higher, even in quiet, compared to young children who are typically developing normal hearing ages five or seven. Similarly, when there was noise that was presented in front or on the side, we saw higher thresholds. So they're having a harder time with this ability, which is to tell us which of the words that are within their vocabulary uh, are being presented. Okay, the, uh, we also with Segan's uh, group looked at vocabulary, memory and executive function. And we again saw that there is a correlation between the ability to identify which speech sound is heard and these uh, cognitive and language tasks. So we concluded that we need to understand hearing loss. We need to understand the consequences for everyday functioning the impact on cognition and language and what the impact is on brain maturation and what are the long-term relationships to other conditions that have been talked about today, such as dementia and uh, early onset of Alzheimer's, which we know is connected to hearing loss as well. I want to thank you for your attention. Thank our participants who have come to the lab. Um, we had to stop testing, but hopefully we will do that again soon. Um, and these are the folks in the lab, uh, in particular, Shelley Godar, Ellen Snodgrass, and Kayla Christensen, who did a lot of the work that I talked about today. So thank you very much for this opportunity for your attention.